Hello everyone and welcome back to the Med Boys podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us. Dr. Erica Tweeden is a dermatology resident in the US. Outside of medicine, Dr. Erica loves to run and has even completed a marathon. So Dr. Erica, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. That's great to hear, Dr. Erica, and thank you so much for coming on again. Um, what we're going to do today is we have a lot of questions to go through. So we'll start with some specific ones that our viewers have and then move on to more broader questions. So just to get started, we wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about your journey to dermatology all the way from undergrad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in undergrad, I also was a neuroscience major, double majored in neuroscience and physiology. Um, at Michigan State University, and then I kind of just segued right into their medical school, um, to, uh, their DO program. So Michigan State has both the allopathic and the osteopathic medical schools, and then they also have veterinary medicine and, uh, and um, NP school there. So there's a lot of people that I was able to be exposed to and collaborate with, which was amazing um, at that very big um, university. So then I went into the osteopathic college at Michigan State, um, did four years there, and then mapped into um, a transitional year and a dermatology residency program. So all dermatology residents, along with like radiology, PMNR, anesthesiology, we all have to do one year of just general medicine, whether it's transitional year, internal medicine, prelim surgery, um, you can also do family medicine or emergency medicine, but I decided on transitional year, and I did that in Bronx um, at Lincoln at a New York City health hospital system, which was a wonderful experience. And then I am now in Philadelphia um, doing my dermatology residency in Camden, New Jersey. That's great to hear, and it's very inspirational. Uh, could you talk more about your time at Michigan State? I've, I've heard, like you said, it's a huge university. I've I think they 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 take in about around 800 medical students every year. So uh, it, it's a huge medical school across campuses, right? And how how's your experience been? Yeah, I absolutely loved um, my DO program there. So we had 300 in a class at the DO program. I think the MD program is a little bit smaller, but like you said, a lot of pre-med students, um, a lot of different colleges there. So a lot of great resources. Um, Michigan State um, has a osteopathic scholars program that you can kind of be a part of as a medical student. Um, a lot of people really don't, understand the difference between osteopathic medicine and allopathic medicine and what that means. So it was really great to have exposure to that um, in order to realize what the difference is and what you are expected to learn uh, in osteopathic schools. But there's a lot of great resources in, on campus and then a lot of great ways to get involved with research. And I think you touched on one of the most frequent questions we get from our viewers, and that is, what is the difference between an MD and a DO? I think you're one of the most qualified people to speak on this, so please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So osteopathic medicine is a holistic approach to um, approaching the patient, and that's not to say that allopathic do doctors don't do this as well. Of course they do, and that's just kind of modern medicine these days. We do evidence-based medicine. We look at the patient as a whole. Not every patient is the same, so why would we treat them the same? But really the difference between osteopathic medicine and allopathic medicine is that every single system, we're just reminded of this fact um, to like treat the patient as a whole um, in this holistic view. And then our osteopathic tenants are really um, reinforced into us. Another thing that's different, um, we learn all the same medicine, of course, and the medical treatments and appropriate medications and such, but we also have this extra tool of osteopathic manipulative uh, medicine, which is a hands-on approach to treating the patient. Um, not every DO student will go off and practice it after medical school, but it's, it's there. We're all trained in it all four years, all four years, we get exposure to it in books and class, like, you know, pre clerkship classes, but then we also go out into the community during our clinical rotations and we practice on them as well. So there's a lot of great tools to kind of choose from um, in the field of DO. 
And again, like I said, there's, I know actually a lot of allopathic doctors who have done a plus one in osteopathic medicine after residency so that they can then practice as well. Um, there's also allopathic doctors who have just learned from other DOs on how they practice. So it's not to say that allopathic doctors can't do this. It's just that osteopathic school is focused really on these kind of principles. And thank you so much for clarifying that. We've had a few deals on our channel, but that has to be the best description we've heard so far. Oh. <laughs> and um, this is a perfect transition into our next question too. Um, I've heard about osteopathic manipulative treatment or, or medicine um, in some places, especially like Dr. Mike videos, because he talks about um, DOs a lot. Um, could you tell us more about what that actually is and what do you learn on a practical basis? Yeah, so um, OMM is really a neuromuscular focusing on the skeletal system, how that interacts with like lymphatics, um, muscles, and all the neurovascular system, and really um, focusing on structure and function. So if we find um, an area is at, the structure is abnormal or there's some type of resistance or restriction in that area, we do we have various treatment modalities in order to kind of relieve that structure, fix the structure so that the function is um, improved. So there's muscle energy treatment, um, lymphatic drainage, there's uh, like HVLA, which is the, the um, quick movements um, for skeletal realignment. There's a lot of great things. Um, I'm not an expert in OMT by any means. I definitely had a great exposure, but for dermatology, dermatology and then other sur surgical specialties, the area that we would probably be more focused on is like myofascial releases or lymphatic drainage for after post-procedure. Um, again, we're not really doing a lot of the skeletal realignment in dermatology. Yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, and since we are on the topic of uh, dermatology and DO, um, I, I've watched a couple of your videos of you mentioning that it's 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 certainly difficult for a DO medical student to um, apply to competitive specialties like it is for any other medical student. Um, why do you think, and if you think the negative stigma still exists um, with the uh, uh, with the DO degree and um, and why do you think it's harder for DO students to match into competitive specialties now that the stigma is being eliminated? Yeah, um, so this isn't just a unique feature of osteopathic students. It's also seen in IMG students as well. Um, there's a lot of, there is still bias there. Unfortunately, it's slowly uh, waxing away as, you know, the field of osteopathic medicine has grown. We're only 55 years old. So to kind of grow as a profession has helped be able to like eliminate some of that bias, but it is still there, whether it's explicit or implicit bias, definitely get it. And unfortunately it even happens from mentors or people that are advocating for me, they, you know, like me, they really want me to succeed, that they're wishing me the best, but then they'll have little comments like, oh, maybe you want to choose an easier field to get into than dermatology. And they mean it well, they're not trying to like hurt, you know, my feelings or anything or discourage DOs, but it, it's the realistic nature of it. Um, with the merger, there has been um, some good things and some bad things that have happened with the ACGME merger. So there was traditional osteopathic residency programs that were a little bit more, they are DO friendly. They keep that osteopathic recognition, but now there, um, there are opportunities for allopathic, pro, uh, allopathic students to match into those programs as well, which is exactly what we want the merger. That's the reason why we went into, it. we want to be integrated as, you know, in real life, we practice as we're integrated. There's no reason for residency programs to be separated. But in order for that to happen, these osteopathic programs that were traditionally just taking DO students, or actually they had 0% MD students, they now have 25% of MD applicants taking those spots, which is great. 
but unfortunately the allopathic or the traditional allopathic programs have not kind of re reciprocated that um, kind of change. It's actually decreased, <laughs> which is very odd. Uh, it was, I have to look back at the data, but somewhere around like 0.9% uh, DO students were matching into these fields and it actually decreased um, after the merger happened. Hopefully things are changing. I'm one of the, I am the first DO student to match into my dermatology program, which is great. Um, so it's not to say that these programs are, you know, trying to keep a, keep all the DOs out. They're not doing it on purpose. It's just the way that they're looking, the people that have expressed interest in their programs also makes a difference. And there's not a lot of DOs that are being exposed to these big allopathic academic programs. So unless you're seeking it out as a DO student, you're not going to really be on that, that program's radar. So it's a little bit of um, both sides to the story, of course. Yeah, um, it, it's unfortunate. Like the the neg the negative stigma still exists because of the the traditional thinking. Um, I actually saw in the news, um, it was a few weeks ago. I don't want to out the company, but there was a company that did not want to sponsor um, an osteopathic uh, medical student just because they had a DO degree, and they mentioned that they would only sponsor MD students, um, which which I thought was really messed up, but. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you, do you think that that's ever going to go away or would that stay around? I am absolutely hopeful that it will go away. Um, but there's definitely, I have so many stories that are like that um, for interview dinners where they're listing every allopathic medical students um, college that or medical school that they're from, but not the osteopathic student or, you know, even point blank statements from um, older generations being like, I will never take a DO, I'll never take an IMG. Um, and kind of at what I was also fascinated to learn was that some programs actually just weed out all of those applicants, like, because they were getting, they were receiving, you know, hundreds to almost a thousand applicants just for, you know, a few spots in dermatology. So it was just one way to cut back very quickly on how many applications they had to read through it was to just eliminate all the IMG applications, eliminate all the DO applications, which is very disheartening. Um, and that's why, you know, th there's definitely barriers that we still need to break. Um, but I am very, very hopeful that it will change, um, especially as we keep growing older as a profession. Yeah, exactly. And I think that IMGs and DO students offer a unique perspective to healthcare. And I think that this, this importance of perspective is really underscored even here in Canada, where they emphasize sort of, uh, you know, a, a lot of diversity in the training we receive, as well as the people that are even selected to attend medical school and beyond. Uh, so I guess more on the topic of perspective, how do you think your DO background and your DO education has influenced your practice in dermatology today? Yeah, that's a good question. So I specifically sought out uh, osteopathic programs for medical school because my dad's a DO. I watched how he practiced. Um, and then I also just being having that exposure in uh, undergrad of the osteopathic medical scholars program, understanding a little bit more of the philosophy. This is just what I wanted ingrained in my brain. I wanted to look at every patient as a single individual who comes from these social backgrounds, who has certain religious, you know, ways about them that they, they this is how they want to be treated. And it's important to think, okay, this person isn't just coming in for a basal cell. I need to treat them like every other person who has a basal cell. If they have a different cultural background and they're expecting a certain way of being treated medically, then you have to incorporate that. And I think what my medical school did a great job is just rewiring my brain to that's how I approach the patient. Um, I also was going to say that I think from early on in medical school, I was exposed to touching patients. I know that sounds super weird, but it's not, it's not intuitive to touch a stranger, but having that comforting, like touch on the shoulder, like when someone is 
extremely anxious, extremely worried, you know, they're getting the worst news of their life, having some, someone to like feel comfortable enough to like touch their shoulder, tell them that it's going to be okay. And just sit there with them and super a great skill that I learned and I still use in practice. And then obviously dermatology is a very visual hands-on. We need to be able to feel the lumps and bumps. So I, um, I'm appreciative. I don't feel awkward anymore touching people. That, that's really interesting. I, I, and I can really relate to that um, because I was just seeing patients a few days ago and they're just in these horrible conditions, but I never know what the boundaries are for me to just go and sit with them or just say, how are you feeling? Or like put my hand on their shoulder because I'm there with a resident or I'm there with an attending. I don't know how to like navigate that. So it's really cool that your medical school actually taught you this. Um, you talked about dermatology. Um, there's so many subspecialties with, within dermatology um, that are so cool. Like we learned about Mohs micrographic uh, surgery in one of um, our sessions, and that was really, really fascinating. Are there any areas that you're specifically interested in, especially for fellowships? Yeah, so there's, I think that's why I was so excited about the field of dermatology, because it's so versatile. There's so many different facets and subspecialties, and a lot of dermatologists can practice a little bit of everything. So not only will you only be a pediatric dermatologist, but you can see adult patients as well. You're not only a dermatopathologist reading slides all day, but you can do clinic in the morning and then read your slides in the afternoon. Just thought that was really cool and a great option for a career that you can kind of stay stimulated. I actually um, didn't decide on dermatology until I was pretty late. Um, I was like a third year medical student, but I knew that I really liked surgery when I was exposed to the field, I really focused on what part of the surgery was I excited about. And it was really the putting people back together and the suturing of the um, the skin and making sure that like everything aligned perfectly. So I then kind of switched gears and I was like, what, if this is what I'm excited about, then what area would that be? would I see myself being able to do? Do I want to stand in a body cavity just to look forward to the closing aspect of the, the surgical procedure? So I found, I, I learned about Mohs micrographic surgery and I thought, wow, not only are you cutting out the cancer and you know doing it as minimally as possible, but you're also the one who's reading the slides and then you go back and put the patient back together and you send them away cancer free. And I, I was just like, this is the greatest thing in the world. So I definitely would love to do most. That's very good to hear. And, and since we're talking about, um, you know, sort of your, your dermatology residency currently, um, we want to know what your day looks like. So if you could just run through your, I know every day varies, but if you could just run through your normal day in the life just you know around what time you need to be at the hospital what time you do certain activities so if you could just run through that would be great yeah i would be happy to i want to preface by saying every residency is going to be different um different academic centers are going to have more call than others it depends on what you are interested in um and what your life you want you want to see yourself so for me i'm at a very academic heavy center. Um, we take a lot of call because there's not a lot of, a, there's not many of us. Um, so I'm actually on call right now and my beeper next to me. So a normal, I'll tell you about a normal day while I'm on call. So typically we have lecture at seven or seven 30 and go in for either an hour to or a half an hour. And then, um, see patients from eight to around 11, take lunch. Um, and then at 12, 15, we take we have afternoon clinic, 12, 15 to two. And then after afternoon clinic, we'll then go to the hospital and see whatever consults were placed around on any patients that are still there that need to be seen um, and managed. And then when I'm on call, I'm the one who writes up all those notes and does all the biopsies or anything extra. So if you, on a normal day, someone could be done by four or they could be done by six, you know, it, it just depends. Um, on a weekend, I take home call as many dermatologists will. I don't, I actually don't know a single dermatology residency program that doesn't have home call because um, if they're, we do have 
dermatologic emergencies, but they aren't frequent. So I sit here with a pager all weekend long. If there is a rule out uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome that comes into the ED. I'm the one who gets the page. I need to go to the hospital within a few, like 20, I have 20 to 30 minutes to get there um, and then see the patient, work them up and such. Um, again, you know, not every day, but there are consults that are not urgent that I still need to see. So like today I have to go, at, hence why I'm in scrubs, I had to go into the hospital and just see some routine um, new patients that came in and get that all sorted. So that usually takes about two to three hours. Um, it's not a super, it's not a full work day. So that's also good, um, but something to keep in mind when you're deciding on residency programs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one other factor that a lot of people incorporate is the sense of gratitude. Um, there are certain specialties where, unfortunately, the patients, uh, you know, will never actually end up thanking you. For example, anesthesiology. Um, you know, it's commonly, you know, known that the anesthesiologist isn't necessarily the one that is, uh, you know, acknowledged for the work that they do, uh, you know, in patient care. Dermatology is quite different, even from the dermatologist that I shadowed. A lot of those patients are really appreciative towards their dermatologist because of the amount of things they change in that individual's life when it comes to diagnosis of like melanoma, very scary skin cancer. Uh, but I want to sort of ask you if you had a memorable patient success story, um, you know, where your dermatology expertise made an impact on this individual's life. If you could just speak on one, uh, you know, story to inspire us all, that would be amazing. Oh my gosh, it happens so much in dermatology. You have no idea how bothersome an itch can be. People are absolutely like all, like so miserable. So when you can fix that for them, they are so eternally grateful. And I think that speaks to, you know, why dermatology for everyone is very competitive because it is a rewarding field. Um, but the uh, there's a specific example just because it happened literally on Friday. Um, this patient came in longstanding um, alopecia totalis, which means they have hair loss in the entire scalp as well as eyebrows. A young kid, um, 16 years old. So if you can imagine being in high school with, for your entire high school, he's had this since he was 11. So five years, he's just not had any hair. Um, so to imagine how brutal that is. And in August, we put him on a new jack inhibitor, um, lip flulo which is actually just recently got a uh, FDA approval in July for 12 and up. So it was great. It was new. He's been on literally everything on label and off label and nothing's really helped. He had maybe baby um, Bella's hairs developed, but I saw him on Friday and it, he had a full head of hair and it was so amazing. So I'm really excited. I'm going to present him at, um, our conference in two weeks and, you know, give a great example of how these jack inhibitors are definitely helping our younger patients and um, those with alopecia. That, that's a very inspiring story. It might even uh, make me switch to dermatology right now uh, for the, <laughs> my residency decisions, um, even though it's quite a while away, but that, that was a really good story. Um, dermatology, I feel like has so many positives. Um, it's a great lifestyle. You get to do a lot um, even surgery, if you want to, um, what would you say are some of the negatives that you would consider when you were applying? Negatives? Um, that's a good question. I think, honestly, the only thing that was deterring me so much was the negative things I was hearing, unfortunately. Um, the people who were like trying to discourage me from going into dermatology. Um, so that was probably the biggest negative. Um, I'm trying to think, I really, I love my job. Um, <laughs> I don't have any things that I don't love doing every day. Also, I was considering for a while, my dad's a family med doctor. It was a great practice. I really wanted um, to love family med. I really tried to, um, it just isn't for me, um, but, 
that's okay. You know, not every field is going to be for every individual and you will figure that out <laughs> once you're on your rotations. You don't need to worry your first and second year what you're going into. I want to emphasize that. You need to just focus on your studies and make sure you're doing well. So we've heard a lot of good things about um, dermatology. So we want to ask you as a um, uh, for for medical students who are looking to get into applying to dermatology, one I want to ask you how important you think research is to dermatology, and uh, was there anything else that you you did besides research uh, to stand out as an applicant? Yeah, so um, research is definitely important in dermatology. I wouldn't say it's the end all be all. There's definitely programs that you can get into with just a couple case reports. Um, but for the majority of programs, you're definitely going to want to have um, a solid amount of research and prove that you know how literature works and like how the process works. And um, so definitely research is important. I think other things that are important or help me were um, being an app. Uh, active member of my community. Um, I had a leader, leadership position of the president of the um, Sigma uh, uh, the SSP, which is the basically osteopathic version of the AOA, um, the Honor Scholars Program, where you know we did a lot of volunteering, a lot of things for our community. So definitely being active in that. I think the most thing, the the most important thing in the the thing that can break or make whether you're going to be able to be having any red flags on your application or grades. You definitely want to make sure that you're not having any fails. You want to make sure that you're um, passing all of your board exams first try. So these are things that, you know, you want to make sure you're doing well. If you are, then you can add on the research. You can add on the community service and the leadership positions and the other hobbies and such. But and uh, and since we're talking about applications as well, we've heard a lot of things about, you know, reference letters and how they emphasize reference letters a lot. Could you speak on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So that is also something I wanted to bring up. Um, I think the biggest reason why I was able to match up such a great program is my letter of recommendation. Um, having good mentors is huge. You want to have mentors not only that are, you know, big names in dermatology that know you um, because the field of dermatology is very small. So having um, people who will advocate on your behalf, on your work ethic and, you know, uh, who you are as a person um, is very important so that they can give you good letters of recommendation. You also want to have mentors that are residents um, because they just went through the application process. Things are changing every single year. So my year, three years ago when I was applying, they just started the signaling process where we had three signals that we could give out and you know that just signal to programs that you were interested in them. Now, this most recent application cycle, it was like 30. So they had 30 signals and bit and like um I think three or three or five that you could give them a gold signal. So if you weren't getting one of those 30 signals from an applicant, the chances of you getting an interview are very, very small. Um, you know, they're not going to waste in their time interviewing you if you weren't even in their top 30 of programs. So I think having a mentor that can talk to you about that process is super important too. Um, so having a couple different mentors and then yes, those letter of recommendations are just, they will make or break you. If you have a subpar recommendation from someone who is a big name that also can really hurt your application you know people can read through that and more on step one and step two you know those dreaded exams that all medical students in the u.s have to take or any prospective medical students interested in applying to u.s med schools at least most of them can you talk a little bit about your experience studying for them and sort of how they impacted your matching process yeah, so um, I took both the DO and the MD boards. Um, so I took both level one and step one and level two and step, uh, step two. And I was also still, when they were do giving grades or like numbers, um, it wasn't just pass fail for step one, level one. So I think that is kind of the reason why, again, I was able to match at such a great program. 
is because they were able to see my direct comparison to allopathic um, medical students. And I think that, you know, is a strength of taking that that exam, um, especially for DOs. And I think it was a very, I think my personal opinion is that it's going to be detrimental to DOs that they got rid of that scoring system um, because now you can't really be like, hey, I'm directly equivalent. You can't say anything otherwise. You know, you can't let that implicit bias shine because here's my score. Um, but so step one really sets you up for step two. So if you're not doing well on step one, you're probably not going to do amazing on step two. Um, they really do go hand in hand and build off each other. So even though it's pass fail, I would still recommend like doing your full dedicated period and then um, just knowing that it's going to pay off in the long run. Dedicated is the most miserable time. It like just point blank going to say that. Unfortunately, it's true. But when you go on the other side of that and you look back, you know so much medicine. And that medicine is going to stick with you. And something that I didn't really realize as a first and second year is how much that is going to play, even if you specialize or you subspecialize. I need to know a lot of this micro you know, nuances. I'm still kind of thinking of the DNA versus RNA viruses all the time. So just making sure that you learn it well that, that first time is gonna just pay off in the long run. So don't skim, like you're gonna have to know it anyway. So might as well really, um, really learn it. That's, um, that's very good advice because um, I've been dreading studying for step one. <laughs> we obviously don't like have to do it, but I'm interested in moving to the States if the opportunity does come up. Um, yeah. And it just feels like the MCAT, like when I was studying for the MCAT, it feels like I'm in the same boat and it's like I have PTSD from back then. I will say it's very different than the MCAT. The MCAT is a terrible exam. Like the things you have to learn for the MCAT, you never need to know. So it's a silly test. Step one is very different. And like, yes, it's a terrible standardized test. You're going through hell to try to like learn, like learn everything. And you're just dedicated studying all day, every day. But that information is actually pertinent to practicing medicine. So it's it's definitely different. That, that That's also, um, I'm happy to hear that because it's, especially in Canada, we're very clinical focused um, compared to the US for it, where it's a much more basic science and you're actually learning the pathophysiology a little bit more. Um, did you just use like your world and the and first aid and the general resources to study or did you use something special? Yeah, so I definitely did UWorld and first aid, like every medical student in the entire world, but I also did sketchy and pixterize because I'm a very visual learner. And in order to learn those sketchy and pixterize um, mnemonics, I used Anki to kind of uh, teach my brain the, all the information that was in the sketch. I found sketchy to be extremely encompassing. Anything that I needed to know was in those sketches. I would definitely recommend. Um, but sketchy is not going to work for everyone. Not everyone learns that way. And so to figure that out your first year is important. You can do boards and beyond. You can do pathoma. Any of those resources are great, but I would recommend sticking to one. Because if you're trying to dip in every single one of those, you're not going to have enough time. Um, and each one of those is going to be well encompassed encompassing enough to do very well in the exam. So just figure out which one's the best one for you and then learn it through and through. Um, but doing active learning and spaced repetition is super key. So no passive learning. You just sit there and watch all the boards and beyond videos and you're not actually testing your knowledge on that. You're not going to obtain or retain it enough. There's just too much information. And it's going to keep going through. So you have to be doing those U world question banks. You're going to have to be doing your Anki cards. So you don't have to do Anki cards, but you have to do some type of active learning. That's a very good tip. And um, I, I'm sure medical school really helped you um, develop a, a good time management strategy um, if you hadn't had one before medical school. But I want to ask you how you're balancing your life now that you're in, you're in your second year of residency, especially in a specialized field like dermatology. 
Yeah. So it just like medical school, you really have to set aside time for yourself. It is important. That way you don't like the chances of getting burned out are a little bit less. Um, if you don't give yourself that mental break, there's no way you're going to be able to just keep going on 100% the entire time. Um, for me, it is running. Um, now <laughs> when I was in medical school, I was, uh, I worked out, I did orange theory classes, um, just I did orange theory because it's very efficient. Um, now I have a little bit more um, like <laughs> this chaotic energy of doing marathons. I'm running an ultra marathon next weekend. So it's escalated very quickly, but it's also, I it allows me to put a lot of my um, intense energy into something else because I've heard a lot of feedback that I am an intense person. So over the years, figuring out you know, that's something that I need to like channel into something different. That's kind of my segue. So definitely listening to what people have told you and then focusing your hobbies. Like if you need to be more relaxed or like you need to find something different, maybe music, maybe learning a different skill, like picking up guitar or something like that, um, or learning how to cook. I don't care what it is, but you need to be able to give yourself an hour of doing something that's just for you. Um, and an hour out of 24, you can, you can do it. Um, but to it, people really get burned out when you, um, when you are, you know, you're only doing medicine 24 seven. I have to say that's such an interesting way to think, uh, you know, taking the feedback you get from other people about your personality and channeling that into specific hobbies or passions. That's something that, I don't know, it seems so like, it seems very doctor like i would say honestly um but i actually want to ask you you know about uh, more about like other hobbies you have uh, you know uh, i actually got this uh, this advice from a family doctor who's told me that you know those first two years of medical school are the chance for you to develop those habits those good habits those hobbies those things that you've always wanted to do because later on you'll be hard pressed for time due to other commitments and uh, one of your commitments is social media. You post often, you know, you've got quite a large following. So I want to ask you, how did you get into social media? Is that something that's part of your personality as well? I would say absolutely not. So I definitely think that I don't even consider it a hobby because a what I got, the way I got into social media was even when I was a medical student, had not matched dermatology yet. I was getting all of these questions on what should you do? Like all of this advice, because there aren't many people who go into dermatology, but there's a lot of people who are interested in it and they may not have the resources or the ability to ask those questions. And I also noticed that not everyone wants to ask the people that they're shadowing. Like, you know, you go and you shadow for a dermatology rotation. You don't want to bog them down and ask them, hey, you know, can you answer the, all these questions about what I should be doing in order to match dermatology? You want to look great. You want to like really shine. You don't want to, some people don't want to ask those questions. So what I started doing was posting those, like the questions that I was getting very commonly online, um, just so I didn't have to keep repeating myself. And when people would ask for, you know, how did you match DO or how much research do you need to do? I created those videos because I remember the way I learned about dermatology was through podcasts or YouTube videos and things like that. So I wanted to be able to give an updated version of that since I had just been going through the process. Um, and from that, it's kind of taken off to now it's my outlet. Sometimes maybe if I'm making a joke or, you know, I see a viral trend and I just uh, equate it to how I feel, but it, <laughs> I think I don't associate that. I don't want that to be my personality. <laughs> I definitely want to keep it as a opportunity to be able to answer questions for medical students. And that's why I'm so happy and grateful to be here to like answer more questions this way. That way I can direct people to, you know, your YouTube channel and be like, hey, that I answered a lot of the questions that you have. Um, if you want to watch this video and let me know if you have anything additional that you want me to answer. Um, it doesn't it's kind of a uh what's the word um like 
the word I'm thinking of is like it's 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 good for me because I don't have to spend the time um I'm blanking you know, on what I'm trying to say it's it's more efficient in, in a sense there you go I love that <laughs> yeah we totally can relate to that we just had someone um asking us about the MCAT a few days ago and and Ruchel got a bunch of um dms for that and he just sent our videos to them because he's like i put everything super efficiently into these videos and you just have to watch this <laughs> we totally understand and um at the same time we like we totally agree with you we don't want this to become our personalities um we got recognized once in person and that was like a huge deal for us but now we're like known as the med boys and not like individually as our names <laughs> so that was also a really weird experience um, I wanted to ask you a very social media type question. Um, mm -hmm. Since you are in dermatology, um, what advice would you give to have the best skin? I love this. Yeah. Um, so I am a firm believer that every single person should be on a retinoid. Um, you can get a retinoid. So retinoid and retinols are very different. Uh, retinoids you can do at, um, or, sorry, retinoids are adapalene 0.1%, which is also called different. And then um, there's a Effaclair. Um, you can get that over the counter. Um, but then there's also prescription retinoids like tretinoin, um, Tazerac, those kind of things. But I think everyone should be on it to prevent fine lines and wrinkles and then dark spots, hyperpigmentation, and also helps with pimples. So <laughs> there's a lot of great benefits to it. That's just a, a pea size amount, um, dab in all four quadrants of the face and then um, apply it at bedtime. And then um, just avoiding the corners of your eyes and nose, the mouth um, and ears here. So that is one of my biggest recommendations for medical students specifically, wear compression socks. <laughs> when you are on your internal medicine or surgery rotations, you're on your feet all day long, wear compression socks to prevent um, any, you know, edema and like all the changes that can happen in, um, in the skin for that. Uh, thank you for this. And, uh, you know, I have a sister, so I get grilled almost every single day for my skincare. Uh, yeah. So I want to ask you if, uh, if you could name one or two common misconceptions, either you might have seen on social media or just in real life, just about skincare. Um, and, and if you could offer advice for that as well. Yeah, unfortunately, there's so much misinformation on social media. Um, I, the one that's popping in my brain right now is the fake Botox or the, the just like Botox, like a flaxseed, uh, blue that they basically put on their face. And there's just a lot of you know, misinformation out there, which is definitely something in the dermatologic field that we are trying to mitigate. Um, so a lot, like another reason why I got into social media was that there was some dermatology mentors who were like, we need to change this, you know, we need to give cr proper information. I haven't really learned enough dermatology where I'm comfortable, you know, talking about that yet. But I think down the road once I feel like I'm comfortable in dermatology and want to give all that advice definitely hope that I can help um get rid of those that misinformation that's out there and help mitigate the myths that's totally fair and that's a great way to use social media ex uh, as well and yeah with that uh, that brings us to the end of our podcast thank you so much Erica for sharing your wisdom and expertise on our on our podcast today i learned a lot and i'm sure nimit and Numan learned a lot and i hope you guys who are aspiring to be medical students and potentially match to dermatology also learned a lot anyways uh this marks the end of the episode and we'll see you guys next time do you guys uh sorry erica do you have any last words for us um well study hard you definitely do not listen to people who try to discourage you from doing what you want this is going to be the field for the rest of your life you know where you're practicing medicine so don't listen to anyone else um if this is what you want to do we'll make it happen just keep reaching out keep finding mentors mentorship is super important and that's what's going to get you to go where your dreams are